Yes. Welcome to the Spotlight. I'm your host, Behrouz Najafi. And today we're discussing Syria's Golan Heights. Let me introduce our guests in this edition. Author and journalist Arnold August is joining us out of Montreal. And senior research fellow with Global Policy Institute, George Samueli from Budapest. Welcome to the show. Let me start uh, with uh, Arnold. Uh, Arnold, let's uh, start with uh, a little bit about uh, Golan Heights, its strategic significance, how it was occupied, and who it truly belongs to. Uh, it, uh, to be quite blunt, the Golan Heights is actually part of Syria. Uh, it's, it's part of the southwest region of Syria. It was occupied by Israel and its allies illegally in June 1967. And since then, uh, uh, as you have mentioned, there have been innumerable uh, resolutions in the United Nations against that occupation, demanding that the Golan Heights be returned to Syria. Syria is the owner of the Golan Heights. Many Syrians have been ejected uh, from that region in the Golan Heights and have fled to Syria always with the, uh, uh, with the hope of returning to the Golan Heights at one point. Now, if I'm not mistaken, there are over 500,000 Golan Heights uh, citizens who are in Syria waiting to go back to their own country. Now, there's been you know, innumerable resolutions uh, indicating clearly that Golan Heights belong to Syria and Israel should leave the Golan Heights. Now, I have to say as a Canadian, while the vast majority of countries that voted uh, in, in favor of the UN resolution and in support of Syria, among the countries who supported the United States, consistently has been Canada. And we in Canada are fighting tooth and nail against that uh, aspect of Canadian uh, foreign policy. Of course, here, Golan Heights is uh, very important uh, for that whole region uh, in Syria. Mm -hmm. Now, Georgia, no country in the world except the U.S. has recognized Israeli sovereignty over Golan Heights, as you know. But Tel Aviv is pushing uh, ahead with its settlement expansion plans. There are 7,000 new settlement units there. So what's the regime's purpose? Haven't they usurped enough Palestinian land already? Well, the Golan Heights uh, is also rich in natural resources. There's oil there, there's gas there, and above all, it's a great source of uh, drinking water. So uh, there is abundant uh, material uh, goods there that Israel wants to uh, get its hands on, and indeed it has got its hands on. So that's why it's building these settlements to make it a fait accompli. Then, in other words, uh, oil and gas resources, water, all of which actually belongs to Syria, is now uh, to be used uh, exclusively uh, by Israel. And, uh, and hence the, uh, the, the, with the settlements, because the settlements in the Palestinian territory served a purpose. I mean, they made a, a, a two-state solution a non-starter, and that was always the goal. That you, know, you build so many settlements that it just becomes almost impossible to remove the settlements. And I think something of the sort is now uh, being done now. So we've got uh, in, in the Golan Heights, so you, we've got at the moment, well, I think, 27,000 um, settlers uh, living there, and the, the plan, the Bennett plan, is to have it up, reach 100,000. And once you've got 100,000, then the rest of the world can talk and talk about, um, uh, well, it really, this land is uh, illegally occupied, it really belongs to uh, Syria, but what are they going to do about it? It's now, it, it's a done deal, and that's the Israeli method, unfortunately. Mm. Now, Arnold, serious action is what Damascus expects the UN Security Council to take over the illegal occupation of the Golan Heights. Would the Security Council do so, or would it let Syria down? Well, let's look at the Security Council as a fact at this point. As you know, there, there are five permanent members, China, France, Russian Federation, United Kingdom, and of course the United States. Now, among the ten non-permanent members, there has been some positive uh, 
movement over the last year because we, among the non-permanent members, in addition to uh, 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 Kenya, uh, Mexico, and Saint Vincent and the Grenadines, and Vietnam, you also have two countries, uh, Norway and Ireland, because we in Canada fought against the Canadian bid for a seat, a non-permanent seat, on the United Nations Security Council for many reasons. One of the general reasons was a continuous violation of the Charter of the uh, United Nations, and also specifically with regards to the pro-social grieving policy over the period. And we voted against them, and two other countries, what? Ireland and Norway, which, in our view, is far better, not perfect, but far better. We have much a better chance of Norway and Ireland joining, joining other countries in the Security Council, as well as the, uh, amongst the five permanent members, for, for example, China and Russia. So, you know, the answer is we certainly hope so. Hope so. I guess we'll have to see what happens, I'm, uh, especially looking towards China. As you know, the whole situation, geopolitical, international situation, has changed radically during and since the pandemic, which is not over, one of the most important, or the most important player on the international field, whose voice, despite all its detractors from all over the world, especially the United States and the West, is China. China has become sort of a moral symbol for the world uh, based on what they're doing with regards to the pandemic. So if China speaks loudly at the National Security Council meeting, if it does deal with the issue of the Golan Heights, then I think there is some kind of a possibility that uh, some action will be taken. But as everyone says, including yourself and the previous uh, and the other speaker on this panel, there's been so many resolutions passed against mm -hmm. Israel. I mean, you would have to have a 24-hour marathon program on press TV to do exactly. a resume, resume of all the sanctions. But the point is, uh, let us see how things shape up in the United Nations. Security Council mm -hmm. with the new phase, the new composition of that body. Uh, George, how do you look at the performance of the UN Security Council? As you said, there, are, there have been lots of resolutions against uh, Israeli land grab policy and occupied Palestinian territory and elsewhere. But the question is if they're able to push it and actually take some action. Well, I don't see what action um, could be taken because if there were, were a threat of the UN Security Council recommending some kind of sanctions against Israel, then it's an absolute 100% uh, certainty that the United States would veto uh, such a resolution. Um, there is a chance, at most, that the United States abstains, um, but it, 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 it would only abstain in a resolution that wouldn't rec recommend any kind of sanctions to be taken against Israel. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't step much store uh, by the UN Security Council because uh, the United States always has Israel's back. And I mean, it's, it, it's quite striking that uh, Donald Trump, who broke with the international consensus on the uh, Golan Heights, but the successor administration, the Biden administration, has mm. not overturned that any more than it's overturned um, his uh, recognition of um, the uh, making Jerusalem the capital of uh, Israel. So, um, and and even on the issue of the illegality of the settlements of, in the West Bank, again, the Biden administration is holding to uh, Trump's position, which is that it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't set uh, much store by uh, mm. uh, the UN Security Council on this issue. Okay, Arnold, George just mentioned uh, what I wanted to ask you in my next question. That's the Trump administration, you know, lent full support to Israel's land grab policy. It seems that the Biden administration is also following suit, don't you think? Yes, uh, he is. Biden is definitely following suit. But in my view, you know, I've been studying American politics for six, some time, and and in a manner of speaking, the Biden administration is more dangerous for Palestine than the Trump administration. Because the Trump administration was openly, crazy, basically uh, racist against the Palestinian people and fully supporting uh, Israel. Biden uh, is, is much more uh, 
uh, how to say, does so in a more indirect way, using the uh, you know, liberal aura that the Democratic Party likes to uh, surround itself with, as they did with Obama before. And though, therefore, uh, it is easier for the United States, through the new liberal state of Biden, to apply the same sanctions, the same policy, uh, anti-Palestinian policy, against uh, the Palestinian people and in support of Israel. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be careful about this aura of, uh, you know, uh, the liberal uh, aura that surrounds the Democratic Party. Okay. Uh, George, uh, how much longer would it take for what uh, a Syrian official has called uh, the umbrella protection or support for Israel to be shattered? Well, I, I don't see it, um, to be honest. Uh, the Israel lobby in the United States is uh, very powerful, has been powerful for many years. Uh, mm. uh, politicians who have in any way uh, threatened uh, to break the, uh, the bond that binds uh, Israel and the American political elite. Those politicians are <laughs> invariably uh, wiped out. I mean, there are some voices uh, within the Democratic Party that, uh, that are critical of this uh, relationship, unlike um, uh, Rashid Tlaib and Ilan Omar, but they are in a very small minority. Even the star of the team, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has shied away from any criticism of Israel uh, because she, you know, she is very ambitious and she knows that her political uh, future would be very bleak if she ever came out um, against uh, Israel. So uh, I don't see any this changing any time in the foreseeable future, uh, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, Arnold, what would it take uh, to restore Syrian sovereignty over the Golan Heights? I would say uh, two things. Firstly, the uh, resistance in the area against Israel, that is, from Lebanon, from Iran, from Gaza, and any other uh, source of opposition to uh, U.S. Israeli aggression and its policy of cleansing, ethnic cleansing. Now, when I say, um, I put emphasis on resistance coming from Canada, because in Canada, there's a tendency to say, well, we are in favor of the policy of divest in Israel and all that. But you shy away from what I view is the key question. Do you or do you not support the right of the Palestinian people, whether in Gaza or in Israel, mm -hmm. to defend itself against Israel? and also the importance of supporting the Iranian, very courageous, long-term policy of supporting uh, the Palestinian people against Israel. So that is the first thing, supporting the resistance. And the other thing I would say, uh, it is very important to take into account what is happening in the international scale, geopolitical changes that are taking place, for example, there's a new uh, group uh, inspired by the Venezuelan government, Friends of the United Nations Charter. There are already quite a few countries that are part of this informal group in the United States. And their main goal is very clear to oppose any attempt to scuffle or undermine the United Nations Security Council resolution and principles, mm -hmm. which of course uh, would include uh, sanctions and uh, illegal occupation uh, against uh, the uh, Palestinian people and against Golan Heights. So will this new group just formed about two, three months ago, will they be able to uh, overcome the current stalemate and make the big break in the international arena the countries who have so far not taken a stand with, it, uh, with regards to Israel will finally come on board and take a stand mm -hmm. uh, against Israel and in support of the Palestinian people and in support, of course, of the right uh, of, of the Golan Heights to get into, once they get into the realm of the uh, Syrian uh, government. Okay. Uh, George, what do you expect could happen eventually? Uh, would Golan Heights be returned to its real owner? 
Well, I'd like to think that that would happen. Um, I don't see any immediate way forward because uh, the, the point is that there has been an international consensus, uh, well, certainly since 1967, but probably even uh, going back to 1948, which mm -hmm. is that there has to be a just settlement uh, for the Palestinians, and there's certainly been an international consensus on the return of the Golan Heights to Syria. And Everyone has uh, piously repeated that. Golan Heights is legally uh, belongs to uh, Syria. But why has nothing been done about it? Because uh, Israel has this powerful backer, which is the United States. The United States wields a veto uh, at the uh, UN Security Council. Uh, there have been times when the, when the United States has actually condemned Israel. I mean, for instance, over the um, annexation of the Golan Heights in 1981. I mean, that was the Reagan administration. The Reagan administration actually supported the condemnation of Israel, but nothing right. flowed from it. I mean, the the, the U.S.-Israeli relationships just continued, uh, you, know, you know, in a perfectly amicable way even mm. after that. Right. So right. I don't see any immediate way forward. That may be some decades down the road, like my colleague said, that things are changing. Uh, China and then this friends of the UN Charter Group, and maybe that could have an impact, but you know, not in the foreseeable future. Okay. Okay. On that note, we'll come to the end of this uh, show. Let me thank our guests. We had author and journalist Arnon August in Montreal, and senior research fellow with Global Policy Institute George Samuel in Budapest. Thank you for watching this edition of the Spotlight. I've been your host, Behrouz Najafi. I'll see you next time.